Let's see, I think we've got a few announcements here to give you our business of the month. We're, we're going to kind of be recycling some of these. Um, and just so you know, I mean, there's tons of businesses around, uh, but the fact that we're focusing on locally owned small businesses, that kind of narrows it down. You know, we're not going to send you to Chili's or um, Panera or something like that. That's a, it's a local business, but it's not a locally owned small business, you know, in the same way. So um, that's why we select the businesses that we do. We also try to keep a, we're trying to keep sort of a tight radius nearby the church. You know, if we go far enough away, then they'll say, uh, what church? I don't know. It's not, you know. So we want something in our community, uh, relatively in our community. Uh, on that same note, we're more than uh, happy to hear any suggestions or recommendations that you might have about those places. And um, if it's one that'll fit into the schedule, then great. Um, but uh, actually, I think Holiday Market was our first, I think, was the very first one that we did. So it was over a year ago. Uh, but a great place. There's always great things. <laughs> There's always some great um well, there's great food, so you can you can get food uh, for immediate consumption. We might say, make all kinds of deli sandwiches. Uh, they've got some salads and all sorts of things right there at the deli counter. Um, all kinds of produce, all kinds of uh, international food, uh, stuff you never even knew existed. But it's uh, yeah, it's a really neat place. Um, and so, if you can stop by there, make sure you take one of those cards with you just to let them know. That we're supporting them again. They were super grateful the first time around, and uh, so we're doing that again. Awana, it's coming back. We have only a few weeks to go. Uh, if you're interested in helping out with Awana and uh, you're a member, there's a table right back there. You can sign up there. If uh, you know of kids, we're always trying to encourage families and kids to come and uh, bring their kids to Awana. Uh, best thing there would be to have them register online. Uh, they can do that online, and uh, or obviously they can do it in person when they come uh, the first night, but that's coming up here in September, so looking forward to that getting started again. Uh, we have, well, that's here from Sunday. The table's still out there, so there's some information for you, but um, uh, we actually had a few people uh, registered to vote, so that's one of the things that they're able to do with that table. Uh, Rich and Paula will be out there again, so they're going to take it down. It won't be there this Sunday for the next couple Sundays, but uh, the first two Sundays of September, kind of adjusting, but the first two Sundays of September, they'll be out there again with all that information, and again, if anybody needs to register to vote, they can do that as well, uh, but just about keeping you informed uh, so that when you go to the polls, you can make an informed decision you'll see on our prayer list uh, a little bit later tonight that that's uh, one that we added to the list uh, that God will be um, certainly involved in the election cycle that's coming up here pretty soon um is that it that's it all right let's pray and we'll get into the book of Esther tonight God we thank you for your word we thank you for uh, allowing us to be here, for bringing us here safely, uh, uh, allowing us to gather. Uh, some that aren't regularly uh, or aren't uh, here tonight that usually are, we pray that you would uh, just watch over them, uh, give safety in whatever it is that they are doing and might be keeping them from being here. Lord, I pray for our teens tonight. I pray for the youth workers over there. Thank you for uh, just the faithfulness of the Watneys and the Mabins. Thank you for their heart, uh, for the teens. Just pray you give them wisdom as they uh, not only challenge them with uh, the word, but Lord, as they try to be examples uh, to those young people. Um, God, we want, uh, we want you to be transforming lives, and um, I hope our prayers that it starts with us. Uh, God, be changing and transforming us first, uh, but we love to see how you uh, can, can change people. So, Lord, do that. Uh, Lord, tonight as we study your word, uh, as we look into the book of Esther, uh, challenge our hearts and our minds, uh, challenge our actions, uh, challenge our obedience. Um, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the example uh, of Esther and just for this account that we can uh, go through and learn from. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> 
All right, if you would, open up to Esther chapter 2. No guarantees that we will always go a chapter at a time, but so far it works. Uh, I have a really clever title for this Esther series, For Such a Time as This. Oh, man, came up with that. No, I didn't come up with that on my own. Obviously, we're going to actually read that here um, and it's part of this idea with the book of Esther. A couple of things we talked about last week in introducing the book. We talked about a lot of introductory things. So if you didn't, s- or if you weren't here uh, or didn't see it, uh, you could go back and you could look at last week's uh, message and get a lot of the background, the history on the book of Esther. Uh, again, it's during the, uh, uh, the exile. Well, uh, there's a sense in which this is post exile, although they're still in. Persia, okay, so uh, people have begun to return. We have Ezra and Nehemiah, the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Both of those record the events of uh, God's people returning. Excuse me. Got it. Uh, Of of them returning to Jerusalem. And the first phase was to rebuild the temple. And then the second phase was to rebuild the walls, and so Ezra's involved with rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah is involved with rebuilding the walls, Uh, but Esther is somewhere in there uh, in the process of God's people going back. Um, So uh, Esther is a Jew uh, who represents, in in a lot of ways, she represents many people who uh, many Jews whose families were taken out of Israel by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, uh, kind of forced to settle in, uh, in that Babylonian Empire in the east, uh, and they stayed. Uh, there was no requirement to go back to Israel, and if you think about it, there is, in a sense, there wasn't a whole lot of incentive to go back. Hey, yeah, you get to go back to your homeland, where you haven't been for the last 70 years, the, the capital city is destroyed, um, everything else is ruined, there's, you know, there's not a lot of incentive. Uh, so those who went back, went back with a specific purpose, uh, went back, I would say, with a sense of mission to rebuild. You know, this is our homeland, this is where we belong, this is what we want to accomplish. But there were a lot of people who didn't do that. And it doesn't make those people wrong or sinful because they didn't go back to rebuild. Uh, They had simply been displaced and they had, if you will, become accustomed to the new location where they were. Um, So Esther uh, is, um, we were introduced to her uh, as we we started the book last week. Uh, Esther has a cousin. Uh, Her cousin's name is Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai, we're going to see here, is essentially a a government official in some way, shape, or form. Uh, But Mordecai uh, has raised Esther because her parents died, apparently when she was very young. And so uh, being her cousin, obviously much older than her, but he raised her as his own daughter and is taking care of her. Uh, Last week what we saw was that the king of Persia, Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, what he has done is uh, he is um, just trying to show how great he is. Pride was a big issue, a big thing that we talked about last week trying to show his greatness and his awesomeness and his power. And so he threw uh, this party for his elected officials and, and maybe the heads of his army. He threw this party for 180 days, okay, which is a long time. And just because that wasn't enough, he threw a, another festival for another seven days uh, for the city of Susa, where he was, uh, where his, his capital city. And all that was for all the people of the city. Uh, There was nothing withheld, uh, and one of the other things that's specifically mentioned is that the alcohol was flowing freely, and people could drink as much or as little as they wanted to. That was part of the stipulation. Uh, The king apparently uh, drank a lot, and he was drunk, he was intoxicated, and he called for his wife, uh, the Queen Vashti, to come in and to show herself uh, how beautiful she was. And again, uh, there's a lot of different ideas as to what was going to happen or what the intention was about that. Regardless of any of that, the point is that uh, she said no. Uh, And it's not a great idea to say no to the ruler of the uh, ruling empire of the day. Uh, 
uh, let alone the fact that, again, this guy has a little bit of an ego problem. And so to tell him no in front of all of his friends and in front of all of these authorities uh, was a bad thing. And so he decides to ask for some advice. What should I do according to the law? Well, those who are around him said, who cares about the law? This is an offense to, to us even because now that your wife told you no, our wives are going to think they can tell us no. <laughs> and so a new law was written basically saying that the, the wives of the empire were not allowed to tell their husbands no eh, in a roundabout sort of way. Uh, along with that, he banished uh, Vashti, his wife, the queen, and, and she, is, she is no longer the queen. Uh, so in his pride and in his arrogance, some real bad decisions were made. Um, as we get into tonight, we're going to see how kind of the next part of this, uh, this story, these events unfold. Uh, we're going to look at the idea of impacting a culture without God impacting a culture without God. Um, how do we do that? Uh, we have a culture that we would agree is in many ways without God. Um, I've been out of the country a few times, uh, enjoyed both experiences, but um, they were both short periods of time. Uh, but in both of those experiences, there was this 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 feeling in the back of my mind as I was in these other countries, and it was simply described, simply describe it as um, realizing I'm not in America, okay? And, and yeah, you realize that because of where you are and those sort of things, but it's, it's more than just realizing you're not in America. There's a sense um, in which you don't feel, if you will, as safe. Uh, now, a different experience, you know, I know Bob, he's been, he's lived uh, in, in other countries around the world, and, and it's different once you get acclimated and once you get adjusted, and so some of that even has to do with the culture shock that takes place when you go to another place, but there's that sense of insecurity, uh, a sense that goes away as soon as you get back, um, and it's because you're just not in, if you will, you're not in your homeland. Now, there's plenty of places in America where I wouldn't feel safe either. <laughs> um, but in general, there's a different sense because we understand, we know our country, we understand how it works. Here's the, the thing. Esther was not in her homeland. Now, that's kind of not true because this is all she's ever known, right? She was born in, uh, in this Eastern Empire, uh, whether it was still under the days of the Babylonian rule or Persia, probably uh, Persia was already in power at that time. But what I mean by um, this is not her homeland is, is that, again, she was a Jew. And so the sense uh, here was that, you know, these people that I'm around, although I'm familiar with the culture, they're not, the majority of them are not my people, right? Um, and, and the culture, uh, her culture, the Jewish culture, was not the dominant culture. It seems as though Mordecai uh, did a pretty good job of instilling in her Jewish culture. Um, and and uh, we don't, again, it doesn't say much about religion and any of that stuff in the book of Esther, uh, but the fact, you know, we'll see tonight, Mordecai tells her, don't reveal your, your ethnicity, right? Don't tell them that you're a Jew. If, if Esther uh, was kind of absorbed into Persian culture, he really wouldn't need to do that, right? Because she'd just kind of look like everybody else and do things like everybody else. There was clearly an identity that he had put in her uh, to understand that she was a Jew, um, and so that's a, it's a big deal. Um, and what I want to do here is kind of turn this back to America. Um, I think that we do. We feel at home because we are born here, and this is our country of citizenship. Uh, but that's in the physical realm, okay? So, so we, are, we are certainly citizens of the United States of America. But as Christians, it's different. As Christians, we're not in the majority. 
Uh, As Christians, we certainly don't have the dominant influence on our culture. There may have been a time in America's history where that was different. But we recognize now that we are certainly not, as Christians, we're not the dominant cultural influence. The question is, how much at home do you feel in the culture in which we live? Uh, Do you feel like you fit in? Um, And maybe a better question is, are you trying to fit in? Uh, Because that's what a lot of people, a lot of Christians are doing these days. A lot of churches are doing that these days, uh, trying to somehow fit in to the culture that we're in, to find a way to be acceptable to the culture that we're in. They're trying to gain the approval of our culture. And, and they're going to say, well, we're, we're doing that so that we can win people, right? We're, we're trying to, you know, be appealing to them so that they will come and, and we'll be able to tell them about Jesus. And But the problem is, is that what we're doing is we're saying we're going to act exactly like the world in order to convince the world that they need what we have. And the problem is that if what we have makes us no different than the world, then why does the world need what we have? And so while churches and and Christians go about trying to blend into our culture and trying to blend into the world and uh, do as many things as we can to look and feel and sound like the world... Essentially, what we're saying is, uh, why don't you believe in Jesus because he's changed my life so much that I look just like the rest of you? Okay? And, and that's the message that's being sent. And we wonder, well, why, why don't people, uh, why aren't people moving toward the church? Why aren't people's lives changed by the church and by the gospel. And, and I think that one of the things that we do is that in all of this, the world looks and says, well, the church and this person who claims to be a Christian, they don't look a whole lot different. They don't act a whole lot different than anybody else. They, they're not much different than me. I mean, I'm a good person too. But the church, we talk about putting your faith in Jesus to have eternal life. And, oh, well, maybe eternal life. I don't know if I have that. So I'm going to go to church and I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to, you know, say that I, I believe in Jesus so that I can have eternal life. And for that reason, I think there's lots of people who put their names on decision slips. There's lots of people who, whose names get put onto membership roles. Because they've really been told by the church and by our behavior that you don't really have to do anything different except believe Jesus. Your life doesn't have to change. You don't have to be unique or just show up in church, sing along, and then you can do whatever you want to do the rest of the week. Unfortunately, well... We would say fortunately. (laughs) Fortunately, there is a change that's made in our lives by the gospel. And there should be. And it's the kind of change that can't really blend in with the world. It's the kind of change that isn't going to be acceptable uh, in many ways to the culture that we live in. As you think about Esther, Esther was in exile, uh, the sense that her people, the Jewish people, were in exile because they're not in their homeland. They're not the dominant cultural influence. As Christians on this planet, not just in America, but as Christians on this planet, we are exiles. This world, as they say, is not our home. Uh, This is not our residence, permanently at least. Uh, We are not in the majority influence in the culture that we're in. We are, we're exiles. And we need to understand ourselves to be exiles if 
we're going to understand how to impact a culture that doesn't know and doesn't care about God. If we identify ourselves too much with our culture and try hard to blend in, then we hold back from things like sharing the gospel or talking about our faith because we don't want to be looked at as weird or strange or different. We don't want to be put into the same categories of the people who are vilified because of their their beliefs and the things that they do. And, And so what we unfortunately do, because we would rather be part of the culture than understand our position as exiles, we try as hard as we can to blend in. But the sooner we realize that we don't belong here and that we're not supposed to fit in, quite honestly, the easier it becomes to share the gospel with people. Because we already have the expectation that they're going to think differently about us anyway. <laughs> we're not supposed to be accepted in that sense because we're not a part of this culture. And so we have to start thinking differently. Uh, God calls us to do something different. He calls us to impact the world that we live in without being absorbed into the culture around us. Um, Esther and Mordecai interacted within the boundaries of the culture that they lived in without being absorbed into it. They were a part of it. They were there. They had a role. They had a responsibility. They had things that, that God gave opportunity for, but they weren't absorbed into it. And so the, tonight we want to just say, how do we impact a world without God and a culture where we don't fit in? How do we impact a world without God and a culture where we don't fit in? Look at verse 1. I want to kind of get through the, the plot here, what's going on. Uh, it says, After these things, the anger of the king, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and uh, had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended to him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases, young woman who pleases the king uh, be queen instead of Vashti, and this pleased the king, and he did so. So what we've got here is uh, the king realizes, man, I made a mistake. Uh, I did the wrong thing. Now, r- there was, according to the timing here, uh, there's about three years between when he banishes Vashti and this particular event. Uh, during that time, what's happened is he attempted, the king attempted, uh, king of Persia attempted to take Greece, and he got beat. And so he has come back to Persia, if you will, kind of a little bit with his tail between his legs. And, and so he is now missing this woman. Of course, if he's in, at battle, if he's with his army, he doesn't miss his wife because she's not supposed to be there in the first place. But now that he's back, now that he feels bad about losing, <laughs> oh, I wish she was here. Kind of the sense, all right? There was Jew in Susa. In the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order... Uh, and his edict were proclaimed. And when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put into custody of Haggai, uh, who had the charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics, her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known uh, her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. 
Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Sheagaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, uh, the, son of Morde- or the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now, Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month Hebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. So again, you have a, uh, a, a beauty contest essentially that's going to be had here. This is the process of how that was all done. Uh, when it says here about the timing of, of the king actually choosing Esther, so as I said, there was a three-year gap between deposing Vashti and then having this contest. There was a whole year between the contest's beginning and Esther being chosen, at least for Esther, because there was a 12-month period of preparation, all right? Uh, It's a lengthy period of preparation so that you were suitable, if you will, to go before the king. Then we see something kind of changes a little bit. The the storyline changes, and we focus on something different. It says in verse 19, When the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. This came to the knowledge of Mordecai. He told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, The men were both hanged on a gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles of the Presence, in the presence of the king. So we find the first part of this deals a lot with Esther, the process uh, of her becoming queen. Then we have a little story here, and again, this is all in the the sense of the narrative itself. This is a little bit of information we need to know about Mordecai and something that he did that's going to help us to understand something, or that's actually going to show Uh, God's hand, even in the fine details later on. Uh, In case we don't mention it later, and in case you think that verse 23 indicates that we were somehow in the wild, wild west, uh, hanging them on the gallows, you know, we picture, you know, the, the, the outlaws being, you know, hung, you know, from a tree or something. Uh, No, that phrase actually means uh, to be impaled on a pole. And that was a common thing for the Persians. Well, it was a common thing for the Babylonians. It was a common thing for people before that. We know even up to the time of Nero, it was a very common thing to impale people on poles. And the idea was uh, to make a display of um, to make a display of uh, the the enemy or the one who did the wrong thing. Uh, the idea of the display was to discourage you from wanting to do that. Uh, so don't get the picture here as we go through this book that there was all kinds of, uh, you know, there's just, uh, you know, like I said, the, the Old West gallows, you know, somebody's waiting to be hanged by their neck. You know, that's not the picture that we have here. This is to be impaled on a pole. Uh, as we look here and we ask this question, how do we impact a world without God and a culture where we don't fit in? Uh, here's the lessons we learn. First of all is that it doesn't require revolting against a pagan government. It doesn't require revolting against a pagan government. Uh, It would be, 
it would fit our mentality, right? Uh, kind of, if you will, the American mindset. Uh, you know, we could go back to the American Revolution, right? If you don't like the government, let's just throw it off. And uh, if you ever simplify the American Revolution by saying it was simply a rebellion, you don't understand the history uh, of our country, number one. Uh, but it's not even a, it's not an apples to apples comparison with what we're talking about here. This idea of, of, of revolting against a pagan government, we have it in our minds because we've, we've seen it and we've, we've known about it or we've learned it in history. Uh, but in reality, there's a sense in which you say, well, what good would it do Esther and Mordecai? How could they influence the culture that they're in? Remember this pagan culture, uh, a world without God. How could they influence them uh, uh, by rebelling against or by starting this uprising? Uh, this isn't really a great place for an uprising. Uh, these two individuals, remember, that rebelled or that had a plot against the, the king, uh, what happened to them? That's right. They were impaled on a pole. It didn't end very well for them. Uh, I just want you to know that the best way not to impact the culture you're in is to be dead. Okay? And that would have been the case if Esther and Mordecai said, you know what, we've got to change things around here. You know? We see examples in Scripture of revolts, of uprisings, but when we see it in Israel, usually what we're looking at, and, and probably uh, the best place to see it is in the time of the judges, we see the people of Israel in their homeland occupied by another nation. So they're, they're occupied, and so the rebellion, if you will, or the revolt, it, it's, not, uh, it, it's basically to get their land back, to have their freedom back, and ultimately that has a lot to do with worshiping God. So it's not even, like I said, it's, it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison here. What we see in uh, many places in Scripture is we see people who are in pagan cultures, who actually have some responsibilities in pagan cultures, and they go about their business, and they influence the culture, but they do it by going about their business, by being obedient to God. Uh, we can think about Joseph, right? Joseph, uh, second in command of all of Egypt, eventually, you know. But he doesn't, when he gets put into that position of power and authority, he doesn't try to change Egyptian culture. He doesn't try to make Egyptian culture all of a sudden become uh, Hebrew culture. No, he understands what? I'm an exile. I don't belong here. <laughs> this is, I'm out of my element. But God had given him a position of power. Same thing for Daniel. Daniel has a great deal of power that's given to him by God in the Babylonian Empire. Daniel just seems to grow and grow and grow in power and in authority uh, that the king gives to him. But Daniel at no point plans or tries to change Babylonian culture to reflect Hebrew culture or Jewish culture, um, but he does continue to obey God. We've got Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, and Mordecai. We can even look at people like John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, when we talk about being in a, a culture where the Romans were in charge, John the Baptist wasn't interested in a revolt against Rome. Now, he spoke against some of the rulers of the day, but it wasn't because of their, uh, their political practices. It was because of their sinful practices. He preached against sin. Even Jesus. Jesus didn't preach revolt against Rome. Jesus says, you know, to, remember he said to Pilate, he says, look, if, if my servants, if I wanted to lead a revolt, my servants would fight. I mean, but that's not what I'm here for. I, I haven't come for that. Uh, so the apostles, when Jesus turns the apostles loose after his resurrection, they don't go about trying to revolt against Rome and trying to change the political world, the political landscape. It was an understanding that we're in exile. <laughs> we don't belong here. We're the odd ones out. And so they were influencing culture in a different way. Quite honestly, if we occupy our thoughts and our time with ideas and plans of somehow revolting or changing the culture to be a Christian culture, our usefulness to God will be diminished. Yeah, I know that there was a time in, in our history, in American history, where people had that mindset. We want this to be, you know, it wasn't just about having, uh, you know, 
the gospel or Christianity as a central focus. It was like we've got to make the whole nation Christian. Well, there's never been such a thing. And, and our effort to do that didn't exactly work out so well. And if we as, as Christians in America today go about our business with the intention to, to make our nation a Christian nation, we are missing the point. Because then we're talking politics. If we want to see people become Christians, if we want to see people uh, put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ and, and our culture be changed in that way, then that's the way to go about it. Because that's what needs to happen. That's the impact that we're supposed to make is an impact with the gospel. And that's where real change takes place. Because whether or not America ever becomes a Christian nation as we maybe think it might or it should be, um, the reality is that when every person dies, they go spend eternity somewhere, and it's not America. That's what we're here to do. That's how we're here to impact culture, is to impact it in, uh, with the gospel. Uh, so it doesn't require revolting against a pagan government. Uh, we don't have to agree with everything the pagan government says. We don't have to agree with everything that our government says. But our answer is not an overthrow <laughs> of the government that we have. Okay. Secondly, it doesn't require a sterilized, godly process. A sterilized, godly process. We use a phrase from time to time. Um, in a perfect world, right? In a perfect world, this is how it would work. Or if I had it my way, this is how it would work. In a perfect world, well, guess what? Nobody lives in a perfect world. Sometimes as Christians, we think that the only way that we can impact our culture is if everything is super holy and super clean and, and just, you know, full of morality and everything around us. If, if we can create this moral bubble that we live in, then we'll be able to accomplish and influence our culture for Christ. Uh, the reality, I think, is the opposite. The reality is that when we live for Jesus Christ in a messed up culture, in an immoral world, in a place where stuff doesn't seem to be pleasing to God, that's when we show, if you will, in the greatest way, the power of God and the effect that God can have on the lives of people. Now think about what's happening here in this story. And this is another one. We talked a little bit about it last week. We said just because the Bible talks about it doesn't mean the Bible is approving of it, right? So what we have here is we have a beauty contest, okay? Hopefully we're not watching beauty contests anymore, right? <laughs> But the winner gets to be queen. So essentially what we're doing is we are objectifying women simply to satisfy the desires of the king. Okay? Our culture would have a field day with that, wouldn't it? What we also have here is we have women who are forcefully taken from their homes all throughout the kingdom. And here's the thing about that. Very likely they will never return home. Okay, because once they're taken from their homeland, once they're prepared for the king, once the king has his night with each of these women, they are now part of the harem. And whether they ever see the king again or not, they're not going anywhere. They have no say in it. They have no control. Again, whether they're queen or taken into the harem, they may never return to their homes. Um, they were commanded and obligated to prepare themselves to try and win the king's favor in one night. Woman after woman spent the night with the king, and yes, your guesses about their conduct are correct. Then the king would eventually select one of them to be the queen. It's just oozing 
with moral uprightness, isn't it? The whole process. There's quite honestly uh, nothing moral about any of it, really. But what we do sometimes, and this is where the caution comes in, is we sometimes believe that in order for God to work, there has to be a perfectly moral process. Now, there's no way at all that we're going to say, well, we're going to encourage you to engage in immoral behavior because somehow it's God's working to accomplish. No, 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 no. We're going to cover that. Don't worry. It's not what God instructs when it comes to marriage, for example, the way that the king finds his bride, right? It's not what God instructs when it comes to sexual relationships. It's not morally acceptable. It's certainly not the way that it should work in the relationship between husbands and wives and how they're supposed to engage with one another and treat one another. This is the opposite. It's very different from what God would have the people to do. Now, we shouldn't be willfully engaging in sin. Okay? As a believer, we should never do that. But that doesn't mean that the process that the world goes by will be morally upright and pure. As believers, we in a sense can't sit around waiting for the process to be morally pure and morally clean and, and perfectly upright because, again, likely that will never happen. What's very clear in this immoral process and in what's going on here is that God is at work in spite of the circumstances. God is in control in spite of the fact that this is certainly not a process prescribed by God. But who controls it? God does. Who sets the outcome? God does. How do we know that? Because strangely, Esther, of all people, is favored by uh, the, the, the keeper of the harem favored by every person that she comes in contact with and ultimately favored by the king. How does that happen? God. One author said this. He said, perhaps there is a hint that providence is most active in those whose lives are shaped by God's own concerns. In other words, what he's saying is that when we are concerned, our lives are shaped by a concern for God's will to be done. That's where we see God's providence. It's in those people who are living to accomplish God's purposes. That's where God begins to work. In difficult circumstances, God seems to push his person to the front of the line. It just happens time and time again as we read through Scripture. So it doesn't require a sterilized godly process. It also doesn't allow sitting on the sidelines. If we're going to impact the world that we live in, a culture that is without God, a, a culture that we don't fit into, it doesn't allow sitting on the sidelines. That should be pretty obvious, I think, right? Um, the more this book unfolds and the, the events unfold, it will only be more and more obvious that we can't sit on the sidelines. Uh, you can't, uh, you, you know, every year professional sports teams make it to the final game of whatever sport it may be. And every year on those teams, there are players whose feet never touch the field of play during a game. Right? They never actually played in a game. They were on the bench in some way, shape, or form throughout the entire season, yet they still get, you know, they get the, the ring or the trophy or the whatever it may be. Um, here's the thing, though. When it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to impacting our culture, uh, those people, in those instances, did not impact the game, right? They didn't impact the outcome. We can't impact the culture that we're in if we're not in the game. If we decide to sit on the sidelines, since it's so obvious, 
You might say, well, why do we even need to say you can't sit on the sidelines? The reason that we need to say it is because I think that's what a lot of Christians want to do. They believe that that's the purpose in life or that's their goal in life is, well, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I know I'm going to heaven. And so as long, I'm just going to try to stay out of trouble. I'm just going to try to stay out of people's way. I'm going to try to stay out of the way of the culture because the culture doesn't like Christianity. The culture won't like it if I, you know, stand up for Christianity. So I'm going to try to stay out of the way of the culture. And they sideline themselves from impacting the culture in order just to avoid any difficulty that they might run into. That's why it needs to be said that we can't impact our culture by sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, we're to be in the world, as we say, but not of the world, impacting the world without becoming absorbed into the world. Mordecai and Esther, just like Joseph and Daniel, uh, these people had roles in pagan government, right? They were government officials. You might think, well, that's not, that's not right. They shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be, you know, helping out, you know, these pagan governments. I mean, pagan governments, that means that they're bad. That means that they do everything wrong, so they shouldn't be in there. Apparently, that's not the case. God had put these people in positions of authority, in positions of influence, and in positions of power. They were not sitting on the sideline. Now, not every single Jew was in government. Okay, so we're not going to take away from this that, well, God wants every Christian to be in government. But we ought to take away from this the fact that, you know what, just because we have a pagan government, and it is, (laughs) just because we have a pagan government doesn't mean that Christians should avoid being involved in it. Right? Mm, Didn't even know this was going to be political, did you? Well, it's not, but this is. Right? That, that's, what, that's what we're seeing here. You can't sit on the sidelines. If I want to impact the culture, I can't sit on the sidelines and do that. We look around and we ask ourselves, how in the world did our culture in America change so much where we're embracing this behavior, where, where we embrace this lifestyle and this way of doing things? And we say, well, how in the world did that happen? I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Because people who believed those things, people who wanted those lifestyles to be approved and to be put in the public eye, they got themselves in positions of power in order to control the outcomes. If you think it happened any other way, you're wrong. You are. Because that's exactly what happened. There's actually books that have been written that explain the process by which certain individuals, in order to push their agenda, strategically got themselves and others with their same ideologies elected into certain positions of power, and over time, they were able to, if you will, overrun the system. It's the reason why Americans sometimes panic, because people of, for example, people who are uh, Muslim, right? There's been panic over over the years of, well, these people, they're trying to infiltrate our government and they're trying to get these positions of power so that they can bring in the Islamic State and all that kind of stuff. And we're worried about those kind of things, but as Christians, we're not worried about whether or not we're having an impact on the world that we've been put into, in the culture that we've been put into. There are certain ideologies in our country and, and, and ways of living or lifestyle choices in which the people involved in them are very much in the minority. I mean a tiny minority, but somehow it's the loudest voice that we hear. Why? Because the people in positions of power, the people in positions of influence are people who support those ideologies and those ways of living. If you think that Christians shouldn't be involved in government, then don't, don't I mean... You can't support that by looking at the Scripture, okay? And again, not every Christian is going to be, or has the obligation to be involved in government, but do you understand that if we want to impact our culture, there needs to be efforts made to be involved in some way, shape, or form in influencing our culture? And God will see to it. Uh, There's lots of examples where God will see to it that people who know him and love him and want to serve him are put in positions of influence 
And if it's similar to Esther's case, it'll be for such a time as this. For reasons that God has. Lastly, here, and this isn't the end, so don't get your hopes up. We got a little bit more. This is just the don'ts, right? This is the doesn'ts, okay? If we want to impact our world, a world without God, and we want to, to, to impact a culture that we really don't fit into, it doesn't require immediate results. It doesn't require immediate results. Here's, here's why, well, well, the reason that we're talking about this is because uh, Mordecai thwarts a plot against the king's life, right? And it's awesome, that's great that he does it, but how much recognition does he get? Zero. Nothing. Nada. Doesn't even get recognized. Even Esther, she doesn't get a pat on the back or anything from the king as she delivers the message. There's nothing that happens. And sometimes what we do is we only get involved politically if we think there's going to be some benefit for us. Another thing that we'll do is we only get involved politically in the immediate, we, we, what we do is we stir up, you know, the, the believers. We stir up the Christian population. We say, hey, there's this major issue that's coming up, and we need to deal with this, and we need to get on board. We all need to be on the same page. We all need to talk about it. We all need to vote on it. We all need to, and we get all riled up for this one thing, and the day after the vote, whether we win or whether we lose, the day after the vote, we don't care, and we move on about our lives. If the only effort that we're going to make to impact our culture is going to be those flash in the pan, major issues. Oh, hey, here's where we got to change the culture. There's where we got to change the culture. If that's the only efforts we're going to make to impact our culture, we'll fail. We won't have an impact on our culture. Because that's not the example that we see here either. If we look at this example, we see Esther, who, uh, you know, she gets put into a position of power, but she doesn't really get to exercise much of that power for a while. We see Mordecai, who does something great for the king, and he doesn't get recognized for it immediately. Uh, when we talk about influencing our culture, we can't just decide to get involved in trying to make a difference in our culture uh, only if the results come immediately. If we're truly going to impact the culture that we're in, it's going to come as a result of living our lives in a way that impacts our culture. That's what needs to happen. That's what's necessary in order for our culture to be impacted. That's how God chooses to use people. Sure, there's some examples of people that God used, if you will, once, and that was kind of it. But there was a reason why we see that. So much more often we see a life of a person who's living for God, who impacts a culture. God has called us to live our entire lives with the goal of impacting our culture for Christ. Consistently living out our faith results in a far greater impact than those flash-in-the-pan, one-time efforts to change the world. This is why we said when, when you know, the vote was made and uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, right? You know, we can't uh, think along these lines and not talk about that. That's why we made the point after that was done that uh, that wasn't the goal. Right, for a, a, if there was if there was Christians out there that that was the goal was to get Roe v. Wade overturned, you really didn't accomplish anything. Because abortion still exists, okay, and and in many places it's still just as legal as it was before. Um, it didn't do away with abortion, the killing of babies. Um, if that was all we were after. Okay, N number one, it happened over time. So that's this sense of nothing happens immediately. But if that was all that the goal was, we're, we're missing the goal, right? If we want to preserve the life of the unborn, that wasn't accomplished, right, with Roe v. Wade. Not yet, <laughs> right? 
uh, it was a move in the right direction, but it's something that will have to go on. Uh, again, when our lives are shaped by God's concerns, He uses us to impact our culture. So what I want you to think about here, how do we impact a world without God and a culture where we don't fit in? I wanted to identify, just using what we see here, I wanted to identify those things that we a lot of times use as excuses. Well, you know, uh, this is a pagan government, so there's nothing we can do about that. Or the only way that we can impact this government is, is if we revolt. No, absolutely not. It doesn't require a sterilized, godly process. Oh, man, if I get involved with that, it's, oh, there's, this part of that is not good, and that part, oh, and we kind of, we, we work ourselves out of being involved in something, of a process, to accomplish something good, because it's not perfect, godly, and sterilized. Uh, we can't sit on the sidelines if we're really going to impact the culture that we live in, and, and we can't expect immediate results. Because God doesn't call us to live a godly life for now, today. <laughs> hey, if you can hold out for a week, everything will be accomplished. No. It's a life of godliness. So the question would be, what can we do? Okay, we're going to flip it around. We're going to talk about the positive. What can we do to make a difference for God in a world without God? Uh, first of all, practice lawful submission to authority. Practice lawful submission to authority. I put the word lawful in there because that doesn't mean to just do whatever the government tells you to do all the time. I don't believe that the intent of Scripture, when it talks about submitting to government authorities and those who have the rule over you, as we'll see in just a second, I don't believe that we are told to just do whatever the government says all the time. I don't think that's the, the, the instruction. But practicing lawful submission to to authority. In other words, if the laws of the land state that this is the way that a person ought to behave or this is how the society ought to go in order for it to be peaceful and, you know, kind of that law-abiding citizen, if you will, everything that government does, I'm certainly not saying it's right. Uh, government does some weird things. Government does some wrong things. For example, the, the laws about abortion that we would disagree with, um, those are not good. We would say those are those are. Those are against God's instruction. They're against God's word. They're against God's will. Um, so we're not going to approve of everything the government says or does. But what I am saying is that we do have a command from God to properly submit to government. Um, again, when we talk about submitting to government, we need to look at, uh, as I, was, I would call it, apples to apples examples. Okay, There's times when, if you will, revolt, or there's times when, um, overthrowing government, or you know, there's times when those things need to to happen or or can happen, uh, and and we still be in keeping with God's word. But here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 13: Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers, and here's, you say, well, oh man, that's, that's trouble right there. I mean, not all government authorities are great people or wanting to do the right thing, or we think about dictatorships in the past. Here's, here's, some, here's a qualifier, if you will. Verse 3, he says, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. That's a qualifier, which means a, a ruler that is a terror to good conduct is not necessarily what God's talking about here. Right? In other words, if a ruler tries to force you to do something that is wrong, then this may not apply in the same way. Okay? There's, if you will, uh, an avenue for rebellion. Because um, he, he said, Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. If you do what's right, you don't have to worry about the authority. For he is the servant of God for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So when government is uh, making laws that uh, promote the right behavior and punish the wrong behavior, that's the way it's supposed to be, and you're supposed to submit yourself and subject yourself to those kind of governments and those authorities. 
He says, therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of your conscience. For because this, oh, here we go, you also pay taxes, (laughs) for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. No government is perfect. They're far from it. Here's the good news. Practicing lawful submission to authority, even when you don't always agree with that authority, it's obedience to God. But here's the great news is that one of these days, the one who's in charge is going to do everything right. And he's going to rule in justice, in righteousness, with equity, like no one has ever ruled the earth before. And Jesus Christ, when he sits on the throne, he will reign for eternity. And at that point in time, it's going to be easy to submit to government. It's going to be all good, right? It's going to be all good. So one of these days. But we need to do this, practice lawful submission to authority. We also need to involve ourselves in positions of cultural influence and responsibility. Involve ourselves in positions of cultural influence and responsibility. Uh, What we might simply say is don't isolate from culture. Don't isolate from culture. Don't avoid interactions with culture. You say, well, man, you know, the school board, they make some bad decisions, so I don't want to be involved in the school board. I don't want to have a position on the school board or a role or responsibility. I'm going to suggest to you that that's not what we see in Scripture. I'm going to suggest to you that from the Scripture we would see good enough reason to, you know what, if there's a problem there and I have the ability to do something about it or to get involved in it, then, then I should. I should at least try. Okay? We need to put ourselves or involve ourselves in positions of cultural influence and responsibility. You say, well, government's so bad, I just need to stay out of it. I don't know if you've noticed, but, but, but our own homes can be bad. Can be bad situations at home. Uh, churches <laughs> can be bad situations too. We'll stay out of those. No. If you have been placed in a position of influence or responsibility, you have the responsibility to influence that position. Um, Again, the reason that much of American culture has embraced sinful actions and lifestyles is because people who believed in those things are in positions of influence and power. That's how it happens. And the thing is, if it's going to change, guess what? We need to be involved in those things as well. Um, If you've paid attention, and it's hard not to pay attention, um, you know, we get about 50 pieces of mail every day with the different candidates and all the stuff that they're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, the, the ones on TV, the ads on TV have, have kind of been strikingly unique um, because the difference between the two candidates, uh, Democrat and Republican, the difference between the two, if you watch these ads, the main issue is pro-life or pro-choice. People are running. The entire campaign is run on those issues alone. Yeah, they mention a few other things, but the dominant issue is pro-life or pro-choice. And what's going to determine (laughs) the direction that our country takes, the direction our state takes, the direction our, 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 our county takes, is going to be the people who are put in positions of influence and authority. Um, now, I'm talking about government a lot, but I, I'm going to suggest something else, uh, something that I've been involved with a lot. Um, something as small as the, the local Little League. You say, well, what does that do? A bunch of snot-nosed kids that, you know, don't listen to anybody anyway. It's a position of responsibility and influence. It may not be one that we think is going to change the world or change the law or change the government. Maybe not now. But influence now could pay off later, right? So I'm not saying everybody go out and jump into government. If you can and God provides for that, great. But what I am saying is that we should look as Christians, 
If we want to impact our culture, we need to look for places of influence and responsibility. I mean, that's what we do. When, when our kids are playing sports, we're looking for influence in the lives of the parents that are part of that team that we talk to, influence in the lives of the kids that are on that team, however God gives us the opportunity. Those are the things we need to be looking for and taking the opportunities and take advantage of those things. Um, as Christians, let's just simply say, get involved in something that influences other people. Now, as much and as painful as it could be, um, and you'll have to use your own discretion, a, a homeowner's association, <laughs> painful, I know. Uh, but again, just another example. There's lots of examples of places where we can be involved, where there's some uh, responsibility and there's some influence, where we can influence the culture we're in for the gospel and for Jesus Christ. The last one, and this is the last one. Always do what's right in the position you're put in. Always do what's right in the position you're put in. Again, we're getting our, 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 our main ideas here from just what we're seeing, what we're observing in this account. How do we make a difference for God in a world without God? One of the most important things is to always do what is right in the position you're in. If it's a position as a, as a parent or a grandparent, if it's a position as a, a, a teacher, if it's a position as a you know, head of the HOA, if it's a position as the, you know, the coach of the Little League, or whatever it may be, always do what's right in the position that you are put in. Esther doesn't resist this government process <laughs> as, as bad and immoral as it may have seemed. She doesn't resist the process because this is the law, this is the instruction that she was given. She did what is right. Uh, she went through the process in the right way, and God allowed her to have favor with everyone. Mordecai didn't have to defend the king or alert him to the plan that was against him, but it was the right thing to do based on the position that he was in. Um, all throughout this book, the book of Esther, Mordecai and Esther commit to doing what is right. And it's very important. Nothing ruins our influence or testimony more than doing the wrong thing, uh, more than doing something unethical. And we always have to be alert to those things. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says this. He says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, in passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. Listen to what he says. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. In other words, he says you live differently, they notice it, and they're surprised by it. When as Christians, we are in positions of power and influence and authority, and we do what is right, and we don't do the same things wrong that everybody else does, the sinful, wicked behavior, people will notice it has an influence in the places that God has put us. Don't expect praise from culture. If you choose to always do what's right in the position you're put in, don't expect to get praise from the culture. Mordecai wasn't praised when he did the right thing, at least not initially. Later on, we're going to find out that when Mordecai does the right thing, he's hated and he's vilified by a character named Haman. But he did the right thing. He was still hated. He was still vilified. We're not guaranteed approval by the world. Jesus said, if the world hates you, just know that it hated me first. Jesus, as he prayed for his disciples, he said to God, he said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. 
Jesus says, just as I was sent in the world, I send them into the world. We've been sent into the world to make an impact as Jesus did. Don't expect the praise of the world. I would simply say, we do what's right and trust God. In that same book, 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You do what's right. Trust God for the rest. You do what's right. Don't expect the praise from the world. Don't expect accolades from people. You do what's right in the position of influence and responsibility God has given you. You do what's right and let God take care of the rest. Questions? Comments? It's a lot tonight. It's a lot tonight for sure. Gary? Right. Yeah, and that's a great point uh, to to add to that idea of um, we don't we're not just doing the right thing, or we shouldn't expect immediate results. If we just do the right thing, hoping to get a certain result in the immediate, or hoping that a person is going to take notice, and they don't, and we give up, again. The, it's the one that we don't know about. It's the one that saw a faithful, consistent lifestyle, a faithful, consistent obedience to Christ that, that we don't ever know about that because of our influence, their lives were changed. Uh, that's why we do it. That's why we're consistent with that. Yeah, very good. Anybody else? Yes. All right, yeah, that, yeah, so unfortunately that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about right now, so we'll have to cover that at another time because we don't have time to deal with that right now. Yes, no, that's okay, that's okay. It's just the difference between whether we're serving God or just serving ourselves, yeah. Okay.